Security has been high in Minneapolis in anticipation of a verdict, but so far, things have been peaceful. CBS News Chief Justice and Homeland Security Correspondent Jeff Begays has more from outside the government center in Minneapolis. The moment the verdicts were read. Find the defendant guilty. Outside the courthouse, cheers and celebrations, with horns honking, hugs at the site where George Floyd was killed, tears and activists saying his name. Did you have doubts that you would see this day, even though you, like the rest of the world, saw that videotape? Yes. I didn't have doubts that he was guilty. I had doubts in terms of white supremacy. In Today, Washington, D.C., the Congressional group. Black Caucus agreed with the verdict uh, in Atlanta satisfaction, so but shocked this, for some in the crowds in outside the courthouse. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy, I'm shocked, um, but we need to continue holding officers accountable, but we need real legislative uh, change in this country and um, really look at how we can move the needle because this can't keep happening. This cannot be our reality each and every day, bracing for videos. For more, I want to bring in Seft Hunter. He is the director of Black-led organizing at Community Change. Seft, welcome. Thank you so much for being with us. Do you believe that justice has been served? Yes, I actually think that um, today's verdict was an important step forward. I think there was, there was always a question of whether or not um, what the outcome of this trial would be, because we know oftentimes police officers aren't charged um, in instances where they where they inflict um, violence against Black people in this country. And when they have been charged, in most, in most cases, they've been found innocent. So today is an important step forward. I do know that, you know, we have to look at this with some pause in the sense that Mr. Floyd will not be returned home to his family. And so, you know, we are we are um, glad to see that justice was served in the sense that Mr. Chauvin was held accountable for the kind of egregious violence that he inflicted on the community and Mr. Floyd. Um, but we are also just really cautious because uh, Mr. Floyd is not actually going to be returning home. That is actually something that is irreversible in this case. Yes. Um, what impact have, could this verdict have on black and brown communities across the U.S.? And you know, we were always hopeful in this case that that um, what we would see would be um, Mr. Chauvin being held accountable. But as I said, that was not actually um, a foregone conclusion. And in essence, the nature of this case, the very public nature of this case, and the kind of collective observation of this case by not just folks here in the United States but around the world made it somewhat unique. And we know that not all cases are like this. That there's not oftentimes you know multiple videos of individuals showing multiple angles of the of the case and so in essence um, we, we do know that in 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 future situations we have to also ensure that we're actually believing victims that we're not seeing um, the process that we often see which is um, black people being placed on trial posthumously that we often see in these cases and we saw we saw the defense try to use some similar tactics in talking about mr. Floyd's drug use and talking about things that are generally viewed as extraneous to the case but it's uh, but in this particular case the jury um, did actually ignore that and came back with a guilty verdict. What do you think this verdict reveals about issues with policing in America? You know, this is this is a. It's, and I, and I really appreciate this question because part of what I often reflect on is the nature of what it means to be black, it, not just in this particular moment, but in similar moments in the past. And in essence, you talk to black people, and we share universally um, how how afraid sometimes we are to actually come into contact with the police and the kind of anxiety and dread that we that actually come over us, like when we're pulled over or when an officer, um, uh, you know, basically. Um, you know, pull up behind us. And in, in many of those cases, you know, that actually stays with us, right? That actually does not go away um, with this guilty verdict. And I think it reflects the kind of work that we must continue to do to ensure that we, we actually get justice in future cases, not just, um, not just in this one. Well, since the start of Derek Chauvin's trial, more than 60 people have died at the hands of police in the U.S., according to The New York Times. What kind of reforms do you think are needed in law enforcement and the wider justice system? 
So there's been quite a bit of talk about the the, the justice and um, police, the George Floyd justice and policing bill that's being considered in Congress, and I do think that is an important step. But we also know that much of policing is actually controlled by state and local government. We know that municipalities have a tremendous amount of of oversight in actually allocating resources to police departments, and we know that in a lot of municipalities, a significant part of local budgets actually go to policing. And when in many ways we need to begin to see some of those resources being shifted to other community priorities. We know that the Justice Department have some responsibility in really moving forward patterns and practices investigations um, and actually creating you know, the kind of national oversight of police, and that must continue. We also know that, that police contracts tend to be a source that actually protects police in moments where they inflict great violence against black people and, and, and against members of the community. And we know that that system must also have greater accountability and scrutiny in this particular case. And so those are just a few of the reforms that I think we can actually act on right now. There's been quite a bit of discussion about this, and I think, you know, those are those are actually actionable, um, you know, options that we could actually take right now to reform policing in this country. More broadly, where do you think the movement for justice goes from here? Yeah, and I would like to believe that that you know I'd like to believe that that you know we've kind of gotten to a really good place, and I do know that today's verdict is an important first step. But as we've seen just in the last week, the the kind of violence on the part of police against Black people and members of the community continues, and that is actually the precipitating cause that actually brought folks to the streets over the summer and through the fall, and again today and over the last week. And so that actually still remains with us, Elaine. And so folks. Um, movement leaders, like some of the folks that I work with at Community Change, an organization based in D.C., will continue to come to the streets and continue to raise our voices and demand the kind of accountability that recognizes the humanity of black people and um, other historically marginalized people in this country. All right, Seft Hunter. Seft, um, I'm hearing that we are having a little bit of difficulty with your video, but I know you can hear me. Thank you so much. We really appreciate your perspective. Thank you. Thank you.